The harvest is ripe, but the laborers are few. Why did he use that word? God goes to extreme measures to bring the loss to himself. The greatest gift you will ever give this world is your intimacy with God. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are all three inside of me. I've got the power right now. I think what Jesus really wants is people to go. I want to be the answer to Jesus' prayer request. Welcome to the Fuel for the Harvest podcast. When this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, then shall the end come. Hey everyone, and welcome to this latest episode of Fuel for the Harvest. This is Nathan. And this is Charlie. We're your host for today. And um, we have approached this topic in the past, but there's some unique outflows of it on this particular episode. And uh, the topic is church conflict, or maybe your perception of things in the church that um, aren't the way you feel like they should be. So it might not be oh, a conflict. So there's kind right. of two sides of the coin. One right. is conflict with the people, right. and the other is things are not the way you feel they should be. Sure. Yep. Yep. That makes sense. And what do you do with both of those is the question. And um, often it's like, hey, I have this problem with someone, or I don't like how things are going, so I'm going to leave. Right. And is that the response we should have, yes or no? And right off the bat, I'd say it depends, yeah. <laughs> which we'll get into. Yeah, I think that uh, my my upbringing and stuff is you stick at a church as long as possible through all of the all of the most insane difficulties that you can stick through, and then like. I don't know. Uh, my personal answer to this question is it would have to be something pretty egregious to fall into the category of leaving the church for it. Maybe, Maybe we should just work backwards from there. Let's let's clarify. So when we say the church, we're not talking about like the big C church, like I'm leaving the church and I'm never coming back. That's we're smart. talking about a singular local church. Yep. Hey, um, I've been in this church for one month or... 12 years or whatever it might be and I'm leaving I'm going to find a new one yep um versus hey I'm going to stick it out and where's the line yep when I was a teenager you could easily hear me saying these words I hate the church um mostly the Lord had given me the spiritual gift of seeing things Mm -hmm. like discernment I don't know what you want to call it maybe prophecy and he and so I could see what's wrong I could articulate what's wrong, and my heart was, you stinking people, I can't believe, it. you just, you're the t- the worst, you're hypocrites, all, every last one of you, I, I needed to point the finger at myself, of course, being a hypocrite, being so hyper-judgmental of everybody and, and rude, and uh, so I'm 19 years old, sitting at a Christian camp, actually deep camp, um, in the mountains of Colorado, and one of the Forge speakers says, so I bet you've heard somebody say this, or maybe you've said it yourself. I hate the church. And it was like God was speaking to me in that moment. And then he proceeds to say, you know what? You can't hate the church. Jesus established the church. He built it. It was his idea, or he is the one building it. It was his idea. You can't, you're not allowed to hate the church unless you're going to go directly against what Jesus is up to and what he's saying. And that those words penetrated my heart and hit the outflow of what he said was if you have a problem with the church you better you better consider whether or not God's calling you to do something about it like to be a part of the solution rather than just ditching yeah. and leaving and being a part of the problem yeah 100% it's the bride of Christ imagine if someone came up to your spouse and just said i hate your spouse or said that to you Mm -hmm. they're horrible they're the worst I'm sure that wouldn't make you feel too good I'm sure you wouldn't have the best response to them either you might be like bro (laughs) you better back off or we're gonna have an issue here Mm -hmm. uh now maybe they had an issue with your spouse and they're like hey I have this issue this conflict it's not working out here can you help me out right that would be a total different conversation sure Although biblically, they should have probably gone to your spouse sure. first, but but maybe they came to both. It, you it, get the idea. It's, it's not exact. It's not an exact parallel, but yeah, agreed. It'd still be a different response. Yep. So let's start with personal conflict in the church because yep. there's this thing of hey, 
I have an idea or I'm not sure things are going how they should or we're missing something here. Yeah. That's one category. The other is I have something against someone. So, for example, in my local church context, we had a we had somebody write several letters to the pastor. This was years ago. Several letters to the pastor saying, "I don't understand why we don't talk about the end of days more often." Now, he's pre- he just preaches through the Bible. So he just preaches whatever is <clears throat> coming up uh who does this the pastor yeah the 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 method of the church is just to choose a topic or choose a book of the bible and just preach through it so it's not like like, verse by verse chapter by chapter right it's not like it's being intentionally avoided it just hasn't come up for a while or whatever he hasn't hit thessalonians or revelation yet. right basically (laughs) and this person was just infuriated that the pastor would dream of going a month or two without talking about the end of days and ends up leaving the church as a direct result of the lack of teaching mm. on the end of days. And I've always I've always found that a little bit humorous in light of what Jesus teaches about the end of days, being as it's all about, I'm telling you these things so you don't fear. I'm also telling you these things so that you would be doing what I told you to be doing. Yeah. Not, not so that you would be obsessed, because this particular person was the, like, there's hidden truths in, like, it, you know, if we're not teaching about it, people are not going to be afraid enough to get into the kingdom of God and, you know, like like that mentality mm. anyway. So that's one example, I imagine, yeah. in this sphere. Yeah, and uh, I would say, too, there could be, hey, can you believe this person said this about me? Yeah. How dare them? And instead of going to that person and saying, hey, that really hurt, yeah. can we work this out as brothers and sisters? I'm leaving. Like they're a Bible study in, leader in this church. I I won't. How dare that person be in charge of something? I'm I'm done. We're leaving this church. And like, hey, I can understand. I have been hurt by people in the church and yeah. outside of. But just think about all relationships for a minute. Have you ever been hurt by any other relationship? By a kid? Has your kid ever said something that hurt you? Probably. How about? Your spouse, they ever said something hurtful? Do you, you stand up, walk out the door and be like, I can't believe my spouse said this. I'm done. I'm leaving. If you do, you're really stupid. <laughs> <laughs> That's the worst action you can take. No, you work it out. Like you don't, you don't just walk up and leave like because of one sentence. Right. Um, or even like a best friend, like they're bound to say something hurtful at some point. Yep. It's normal human relationships. And that's why I actually think Jesus laid out the solution in Matthew 18. Right. Check out what it says. So he says this. If your brother sins against you, go tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he won't listen, take one or two others with you so that by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every fact may be established. If he doesn't pay attention to them, tell the church. If he doesn't pay attention even to the church, let him be like a Gentile and a tax collector to you. Fun fact about that passage that if you it's either before that or just after that in Matthew 18, Jesus says where two or three are gathered in my name. There I am in their midst. Yeah. And we often think about that in the context of small gatherings of the local church that Jesus is right there. Which is true. I mean, that's what he's talking about right here. The church. Yeah. So fun fact, though. Think about it in the nature of conflict. So Jesus is saying, hey, guys, in the middle of your conflict, in the middle of this, if you've ever been in an interpersonal conflict, and in whether that's with a husband, wife, parent, whatever, somebody in the church, having Jesus present with you in that conflict, oh, that's so it's awesome. Way different. Oh, it's so good. Like <clears throat> the, one, the Prince of Peace yeah. with you in the midst of conflict, how glorious and amazing. Because we know... That you don't have to have two or three Christians gathered together in order for Jesus to be right there with you. The New Testament teaches that he's living yeah. with you in your heart. So he's with the individual. I, I think that there's a special emphasis on his presence with right. you in the midst of conflict here in Matthew 18. Yeah. And even within the gathering of believers in general. Like well, well, yes, You're of all yeah. living stones brought together to house the Spirit of God. Right. Like group-wise, corporately, and individually. And right. so— this passage is in the context of, hey, one to one, three to one, church with them leaders, and uh, 
he kind of brings it all together. Right. And so check out right after the verse that I had read, it continues, Matthew uh, chapter 18, it continues in verse 18. It says this, Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you on earth agree about any matter that you pray for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there among them. Yeah. So, hey, two or three of you praying together, that's powerful. Right. And right before that, he's talking about conflict. So praying about that conflict and uh, a study Bible comments on it. It says this, the two or three mentioned in verse 20 are thus the two or three witnesses that were first mentioned in verse 16. Like you said, Nate. Yep. Christ is present with his disciples when they gather. And when they seek his leadership about troubling behavior among disciples, he will answer their prayer for the sinning believers restoration. Right. Which is glorious. And just as a personal experience, Jesus, there is power in corporate prayer. This is like a total bunny rabbit trail. But I love praying with my wife because I I don't know, like praying with my wife, praying with other believers. I love it because I feel like there's encouragement. I feel like what Jesus says here in Matthew 18 is absolutely true. Like, well, I'm glad you think that. Well, of course, but like it's, <laughs> it, it matches my experience is what yeah. I'm trying to say. No, I yeah. know. I was just yeah. kidding. <laughs> it's true. And, um, even I think that verse applies generally and specifically. So, right. because it says, Hey, whenever you gather two or three together and pray in my name, it'll be done. Yeah. So I think specifically it's absolutely about the conflict going on between believers and then even broader, it's like, hey, when you gather together as believers and pray for something in his will and in his name, it's powerful. Yeah. He's present in that. And uh, we ought to do that, I think, more and more. Um, so, yeah, so if so so if there is a conflict with someone in the church, go to them. Go to them. Try and work it out together. And I urge you, go in humility. <laughs> Don't go and be like, hey, you said this, and how dare you? You're the spawn of Satan, and yeah, right. like, don't do that. Just be like, hey, man, um, I I don't know if I said something to hurt you. Please let me know if I did. But I just I just wanted to touch base and say, hey, when this was said, it really hurt me. Yeah, and I I don't want us to have any hindrance. I don't want any obstacle between our relationship or others. Um. And just go from there. Try to take the humble route as best you can. Right. And Matthew 18 explains the process. So you go one-on-one yeah. and they reject you, then you can bring other people yeah. in. Then grab maybe a I leader, would, who a are trusted. those two or three. Right. I would say it needs to be someone with deep spiritual maturity. Who won't gossip. Yeah. 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 And I think there's only two options for who you bring with you. It's either leaders in the church who have that maturity and are trusted or someone who's aware of the situation because they were around and they saw it happen. Yeah. And so they can be almost a stabilizing voice who says, Hey, like this, I saw it happen. It's true. Like I was in the room when this was said. Sure. And I would say those are really your only two options to do that biblically. Yeah. So bring those people. And if that doesn't work, that's when you're for sure going to church leadership. It says, bring it to the church. Yeah. Go to the pastor elders, whoever they might be deacons. And say, hey, I'm trying to work this out biblically. Here's what happened, and here's what I've been doing to seek reconciliation, and nothing's happened. Can you help us out here? Mm. That's what you should do with that. Now, um, should you leave the church over this? No, you should not. Over an interpersonal <clears throat> conflict? Correct. Absolutely not. Um, a- Of course not. Now, is there ever a time when you should leave a specific local church i think there is we'll probably get to that later because it could be over a specific relationship or it could be broader than that um so we'll get to that in a a minute here but um even when you think about two or three gathering in his name and praying i think that's a solution to the other side of the coin which is i see something that's off Mm. or i see something that could be and they're missing it Mm. how come it's not happening whether that's they don't preach this topic or we have five Bible studies in the church, but they haven't ever covered this most important topic on my heart. Mm. They're missing it. How come they're missing this? I can't believe it. Or, hey, I don't like the color of the carpet. It's old and coffee stained Mm. and messed up, and it's not good enough. It might be any or all of these, something big and actually crucial to the faith and to the believers, or it could be something small, preferential. Should you leave over that? Definitely not. Um, 
what should you do? Well, I think that you should, as you said, Nate, earlier, be a part of the solution. Mm -hmm. If it's messed up old shaggy carpet, hey, do you have a savings fund? Go to the pastor. Say, hey, I've got X amount of dollars I'd like to donate to this, and I'm going to raise, if you, with your permission, I'd like to do a fundraising campaign to get new carpet. <laughs> like, you if you're just going to be like, hey, it's just crap, and I'm leaving because nobody's doing anything about it, maybe the pastors are trying, and there's just not enough funds, and they care a lot about the people. And or maybe they haven't had the capacity and they'll be so blessed by you coming alongside and helping and serving in that way. Right. Um, the church is meant to be everybody participating, not just the select few right. who are leading. I agree. And uh, I think that the the crucial component here is acting with humility. And yeah. I mean, if you're if you're humble <clears throat> enough to be listening to a <clears throat> podcast like this one, then you're probably like you're probably already going to be asking yourselves these questions. So I'm not so worried about the people here, but you might be, you might be in relationship with somebody who you could encourage to look at it from a, a more, send them this podcast. <laughs> you could encourage <laughs> them with your own words or this podcast or whatever, um, to, to see it from a more humble perspective. And here, here's, here's an example. So I've been at my church for 30 years since I was born, which is an un character it's not very common right you don't that's a lot i mean the church i grew up in i was at for 18 years right and i've switched since then due to ministry calling but right but my ministry calling has allowed me to right. stay at my local <clears throat> church that i've grown up in and uh 20 years ago or something like that our church went from one building to another building 20 feet away literally 20 feet they built a, a warehouse style building because yeah. we had outgrown it the other building and we needed a new space to meet. We had four families leave the church because we were going from holy ground to unholy ground. <laughs> and now you could point the finger and say, oh, <clears throat> you know, they're just this or that or blah, 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 blah. Whatever the case may be, I think there was kind of a lack of humility there. The uh, reason yeah. the reason that the leaders wanted to change, we built the whole new building was because we needed more space for for the people who were meeting there. And I mean, we're not some mega church. We're like a 150 person church. So we went from a 75 person meeting room to a 100 person meeting room kind of thing. And like they were just up in arms about it. And all of that to say there's a heartbeat behind these decisions, right? There the the heartbeat behind the leadership's decision to change church, the building was not we're going to go from uh, this holy consecrated ground to this unholy ground. That was not their heart. Their heart was to serve the congregation yeah. that was meeting and in that space. How about the New Testament? What in the world is holy ground in the New Testament? <laughs> Could it not be wherever I set my feet and because the Spirit the holy of God Spirit, takes yeah. over? <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> like wherever the kingdom advances? Exactly. So in these situations, I imagine that there is a reason behind the decision that you that people are taking the wrong way. Yeah. Right. So maybe there's like a, a decision to encourage people to park at a different parking lot or something because there's growth in the body of Christ and we need to figure out solutions. Right. Like just really practical, obvious solutions. And people are getting frustrated about it because it's like, well, this church only cares about growth or this church only cares about money or this church only cares about having a nice parking yeah. lot. It's like, no, 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 no. That's that's not the case so, at all. So there's those preferential reasons, and I would say, hey, slow down, be humble, maybe go meet with those leaders and ask questions and say, hey, could you help me understand more of why this is happening? Questions are good. Like, could you help me know why you think this is just as good or better? Mm. I'm struggling with it. Can you help me understand? And see what you learn. Um, now, that's kind of the preferential side. What about the church is missing something? like vital, like they don't have this Bible study topic or they don't have disciple making. They don't have the mission. Like they never preach the Great Commission. They don't ever say anything about evangelism. There's not a single group or training on it. They just never even open their lips about it. Mm. In my opinion, that's a big issue, yep. big issue. Should you leave over it? No, not at the beginning, I would say. Go be a part of the solution. Mm. See if you can spread that DNA. Hey, 
I'd like to start a Bible study among the other studies. And whatever way your church does that, start one. Invite people to it. Start training people on it. If, if they'd let you do it, do it. And uh, be a part of the solution in that way. It could very well be that God has given you vision for something because you're supposed to be a part of it. Mm. Um, I actually believe, based on the New Testament, especially 1 Corinthians 14, that we all have a part to play. Amen. It, it says, hey, if anyone has a, a, a teaching, if anyone has a hymn, if anyone has a revelation, if anyone has, and it keeps listing off these things, let him bring it. So that's you. That's all of us. We have something to bring that God gives us. So if he gives you an idea for something or you see something that's missing, find a way to implement it there rather than say, I can't believe they don't have this. I'm leaving. Mm. I literally have talked with people recently about this. They're like, oh, I just, you know, like, I wish that this church had this thing in it. Like they're missing out big time. And I see it in other churches and it's amazing how God works in this way. But uh, this church, they don't have it. Or, man, if if the leader says one more thing about this building, I'm out of here. And it's like, hey, maybe you're supposed to be there to encourage people. Like, if you see something, stick it out. Go, go impact people. Don't run from it. Mm. So I think all of us could, could learn from Jesus' words of where two or three gather, it will be done in my name. Start praying for it. Mm. Like, God, I think this is missing here. Amen. Start praying. And then see if you can find a way to implement it. Now, if um, there's an if there's a hardness of heart. Now, yeah, that's and, where we go. What, right. When is it time to leave? Right. So if there's a hardness of heart, if there's a lack of willingness to ex, to expand into the crucial central components yep. of the gospel. So if they're <clears throat> if they're not teaching about evangelism or not teaching about gospel proclamation in some way or another, or God's heart for the nations, or what are some other topics that. Yeah, w- would be like because I want to differentiate between this and like the end of days because like listen, which is, should be covered too. right. The end of days is part of the scriptures, but it's not something to leave the church over because even the yeah. body of Christ has like fifteen very accepted views on the end of days. Yeah. That's an exaggeration, but you understand what I'm saying. I would say core crucial things: the core commands of Christ, loving God, loving others preaching the gospel to everyone, making disciples of all nations. If these four things are never preached on, you, you, like after several years, you might go, man, what's going on? Right. Or the core truths of like the evangelical statement of faith. Yeah. This authority of the Bible, like sal- how do you receive salvation by faith in Christ, not of good works, like this kind of stuff. How? If these are never preached ever, you might go, man, what's going on? Right. Like, and again, approach with humility. If you're like, hey, can I serve in this area? Could I help our church expand on the topic of missions? Could I do a, a Bible study or a, a training on a weekend and invite people? Could we do that and share about the stats of the unreached? Yep. And it's just no, 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 <laughs> no. We don't have capacity for that. We don't right. have time for that. It could very well be that it's okay for you to say, hey, I think I need to find a place that is growing in these areas, and I'm going to pray about it, and I'm going to go find a new place to do that. Right. Pray about it, though. It may be well that God prompts you and burdens your heart to say, stick it out. It's going to change. Or it could very well be that he's like, hey, I'm releasing you to go find a new place where you can serve with your gifts and do it in humility. Um, so that would be one side of it. Yeah, you can— like. You could leave if you are really humbly trying to serve and seeking it out and you've been there for a good while and you've gotten to know people, you've gotten to build relationships so there's trust and still it's closed door after closed door after closed door. There may be another place God wants you to go. Right. And then, of course, there's always the immediate kill shot of somebody preaching heresy on yeah, a just regular leave. basis. Just leave. Like You're if, not going to change that. Right. If <clears throat> if they're preaching there's more than one way to heaven. Get out. Get out. If, if they're, they're <laughs> if they're preaching that the Bible has errors, right. Get out. Yeah. If your identity is not in Christ alone and it could be in any other sector or group in society, uh if they're preaching that marriage is not one man, one woman united in covenant, get out. Yeah. Those are just sinful ways of life that people are starting to affirm in our culture. Right. And 
because it's being affirmed in our culture, it's also being affirmed in local church. Yeah. And oh my gosh, there was just this recent Barna study. Anyway, I don't, we don't have to go down that bunny trail, but after reading the Sparna study about the beliefs of the leaders of the church, I am now yeah. totally yeah. understanding why we are having the American church that we're having. Cause greater than half have like a non-biblical worldview and greater yeah. than half uh, like are preaching things that are not in the Bible. And it's like wild. They'll stand before God in judgment one day. Yeah. And uh, that's what James says. Teachers will be doubly judged, more strictly judged. And it'd be better for someone to be thrown into the sea with a big rock hung around his neck and drowned than to lead someone astray. Yeah. Yeah. So that those are both the words of Jesus and his word in James. So um, not ours. And uh, he's the one that said that intense stuff. So right. we should listen. And then I would say there's other um, perhaps um, also important reasons that you might find another local church. Maybe you have started a family and you have kids and hey, don't don't feel so much condemnation and guilt because you're like, I actually need a place where my kids are going to thrive and grow. Mm -hmm. I Believe it or not, I visited a church and they didn't have any kids programming when we went to that service. And it was horrible. One, the service was very long, which is fine. I'm fine with long services personally. But we had our less than two-year-old like trying to sit in the pew, mm -hmm. walking around, trying to talk to people, <laughs> like trying to play with the other girls who were in our pew. They just can't sit still that long. And on one hand, it's good that they're there, but I didn't hear – well, I was hearing the sermon, but it was very, very tough. Yeah. Like eventually it's like, does one of us just need to leave the room with her? Like – uh, this is not working. Um, so I think there's a reason that kids ministries exist in our churches because I've been in plenty of churches w like that personally or internationally where it's just like kids crying, kids running around. It is hard to gather. Yeah. And I think it's a great solution. So that being said, it's okay if you're like, hey, I need a better place for my family to thrive and grow. Mm -hmm. Like you're, it's your job as the parent to set the culture and DNA of your family, especially as the husband, the head of the household, according to Ephesians, and to do it together with your wife in unity. Um, it's both of your jobs to raise your kids in the faith. It's not the church's job. It's not the school's job. It's not the Bible study's job. Those are all supplementary to help. Mm. It's your job. So you might say, I need to be in a church that has really great kids opportunities for them to grow. And for us, that's okay too. There may be other family reasons like that. And I would say those are valid. Like it could be God provides different communities of faith for different seasons of your life. And those are other valid reasons as well. So don't just run though. Don't yeah. run Don't at the end of the day. Yeah. Don't run. Seek to provide solutions. Pray, pray, pray. And then go and do as God leads you. Yeah, I would I would say the rule of thumb is be patient and slow to make this decision yeah. unless it's heresy. Then be quick to make this decision. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys so much for joining this latest episode of Fuel for the Harvest. We appreciate your time. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Don't forget to unsubscribe and resubscribe, like and share. We appreciate all that. And uh, hope you guys have a great rest of your day. God bless.